papers in uh, places like science and nature. Uh, there are some fun facts. Of, of, I always like to read these. L Lelania asks for them, and then I. Um, so your lab apparently is undefeated in bowling competitions with other labs, uh, which I thought was bring it. <laughs> uh, and you were once lost in Wind Cave for two days and assumed it was the end. Yeah, that's right. two yeah. days underground lost. Uh, well, we're glad you found uh, your way out. That sounds like a harrowing story. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Justin. Thank you. Um, so I am long overdue, as I've been an affiliate of the MBZ for 13 years, I think it's 11 years since I've given a talk here, and um, that's not fair because uh, of me, because I so value and appreciate this community, and I, I particularly feel this campus sometimes struggles with the community, and I always look to MBZ as um, a, a strong one, and kind of an, and a nurturing one, particularly for the grad students and undergrads who are involved and really make it what it is and carry that tradition forward. Um, so thank you for showing up today. I was not uh, really sure I could compete with uh, you know scatological details of sloths or chytrid, <laughs> and certainly Trevor Price deserves standing room only, and I'm not sure I do. Um, I would say, Michael, I've been you all made the mistake of promoting me to professor, so I'm uh, I'm not associate anymore. Uh, but I'll just oh. reassure the grad students: I still have imposter syndrome every time I stand up. So and that will never go away. <laughs> I particularly have imposter syndrome today because I'm going to be talking about something that's a little bit divergent from my limited area of expertise and that of my group. So many of you know, and it's wonderful to see so many friendly and familiar faces. Uh, but many of you know we work as a group on the community <coughs> population and conservation ecology, primarily of mammals, but also other vertebrates. And I think a concerted or focused part of our research is really trying to figure out how humans fit into ecological systems and really look through an ecological lens on the impacts, contributions, etc., of humans to, to these uh, an animal and other ecosystems. Um, but I'm going to kind of go into a population ecology geek out today. And again, it's outside of my uh, original uh, real, or my real areas of expertise, but it's something that I've become really interested in. And as I always say to my grad students, the way to actually make progress on, on, a, on a project is to make yourself give a talk on it. And so that's what I did. I set this out. Ahead of time, I said, oh, I'll be in good shape by the time the mid-November rolls around. Uh -huh. And of course, I'm not, as you'll see. And so uh, it's, it's very much half-baked at this point. But you can, you can work with it. And this is kind of a, a home field audience. So I, I'm expecting a little, a little forgiveness. Um, <laughs> I, I really need to acknowledge people who have been a huge part of this. Cheryl Hajnowski and Felix Ratcliffe are grad students in Aspen. I, uh, they were looking for a project for Tony Barnowski's uh, biogeography class, and I said, hey, I have this kind of idea. It's, I'm surprised there's not been that much done. See what you can do with it. So they had the first start, then worked with my collaborator uh, my, uh, in Ghana, um, Moses Sam. Moses refuses to, 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 to pose in any other way than as if every photo is a, a passport photo. So <laughs> I tease him for it, but that's what we're stuck with. And then uh, assistants and interns who've really helped with sort of collecting data for meta-analyses uh, that I'll talk about. As I said, this is very much kind of work in progress, and I'm hoping you'll see the half-baked nature of the science as kind of a gooey, delicious chocolate cookie rather than like a half-baked chicken sandwich. <laughs> no poultry was harmed in the making of that photo. But, uh, so as this crowd knows better than most, or any maybe, um, we live in in a zoologically impoverished world today, um, and this is a lovely quote, I think. Uh, we live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest and fiercest and strangest forms have recently disappeared. And you might attribute this to a, a modern conservation biologist or something, but of course it was none other than, than Alfred himself, Russell Wallace, thinking about uh, ex the really post-Pleistocene extinctions and what that meant. And I'm going to argue over the next 30 minutes that we know a ton, a huge amount, about extinction, but we know very little about the aspects of extinction that might be most helpful in our preventing it in the future. Okay? So, for example, we know that the ground we stand or sit on today 
uh, not very long ago was covered in mega herbivores and mega carnivores and all sorts of other things. This is, I guess, kind of small for this group. It's just a, it's just a plot of each, each column represents an individual species by body mass. And all the blue columns are species that have become extinct since the Pleistocene in California. And the red indicate extant species today, like the Columbia black-tailed deer and, and things that are just too small on the body scale to even show up. So our large herbivores of today, of course, were basically the rodent equivalents of the recent past, the small-bodied things that worked their way between uh, all the other large things. Um, so we know California, as in other places, uh, and we know this from tar pits and, and, and other approaches, has been transformed dramatically through the process of extinction. We have increasingly powerful analyses looking back again at fossil and other evidence where we're actually starting to bridge together or bring together our understanding of the, the, the duration of, of, of uh, or the, the period during which different species were extant across millennia. We have innovative efforts like Justin Yackel et al. Uh, from a couple years ago to recreate recently extant fauna uh, such as that in ancient Egypt and actually to try and think about species dynamics in those, um, in those past ecosystems. Through ancient DNA, we're able to go through and we're starting to see actually the recreation of estimated population sizes of previously extant populations, now extinct populations. Or even, as you see here, log area, trying to re recreate, uh, and I guess this is mostly through the location of fossil evidence as well as other techniques, but recreate an understanding of the range of past populations. So again, as you know, Paleontology, paleobiology, uh, conservation paleobiology, we have whole fields that are, and as, as well as ecology, helping us put together a, an increasingly clear and vivid picture of extinction over thousands of years. And of course, we're obsessed with extinction today. This is from the New York Times, I think from last year. Um, and we have over 20 books published with extinction in the title over the last two years. Um, and what we know, or what, of course, we're very concerned about are the loss of a whole bunch of vertebrates and invertebrates, 110 flowering plants known to have become globally extinct. Um, and so, obviously, extinction is of great concern to us. And it's, it gives us anxiety, and it also drives us and compels us uh, to push forward in the research that we do. We see... Uh, Disturbing trends like this USGS plot of human population growth as a function of extinction rates, which <coughs> estimates uh, you know 50,000 plus extinctions uh, by uh, as of 20 something 2015. Of course, we have uh, closer to 900 observed extinctions. So the difference between 900 and 50,000 is is an estimate based on species area relationships, which we could debate. And, and discuss uh, at great length. But anyway, we, we, we have this sort of, uh, these kind of perspectives on modern extinctions. We have increasingly sophisticated efforts to look at the spatial distribution of extinction events or, or endangerment and efforts increasingly relying on phylogenetic and other comparative approaches to understand um, where, where uh, extinctions are occurring across our planet. We have uh, sad efforts like my, what's been, uh, I've been ridiculed for my different colored frisbees approaches <laughs> uh, to thinking about the factors uh, that drive extinction on our planet that have led to this dramatic alteration of ecological communities. And we have more accepted and much prettier versions of, uh, more sophisticated versions of doing the same thing, which is actually bridging out the different kinds of factors and accepting that multiple, multiple pressures, multiple, uh, the factors are, are often driving endangerment and extinction, and particularly in, as has been looked at here by Lee and Yetz, is looked at in, in, bird, in bird species. Along with our really very focused uh, sort of obsession, as it were, but an important obsession with modern extinctions, we also have whole, have whole fields of study now looking at the consequences of those extinctions for ecological communities. We have what I like to call, and others call as well, the ecological winners, um, things that, uh, that have done quite well, thank you very much, and in the absence of their competitors and predators, and in some cases diseases, 
or with the subsidies of food and other, other resources that we provide them. Along with that are increasingly complex efforts to understand uh, species interactions in complex systems that have lost uh, individual actors and the incredible uh, sophistication of analyses that come along with our new these new efforts in community ecology to understand changing interactions in changing in changing ecosystems. We're not only studying changes in interactions, but as uh, colleagues and I, and uh, led by Jim Estes, and I don't think Mary's here. I think she's uh, Mary Powers on the road. But Mary was part of this effort as well. We've actually gone through and looked at examples around the world of how local extinctions have led to full state shifts in ecosystems. Um, and again, this, is, uh, this uh, brings together uh, limnological work by folks like Steve Carpenter, um, Jim Estes' work on otters, and Tony Sinclair's work on, on wildebeest, as, as well as many, many other um, iconic research programs. So again, we've studied the dynamics of past extinctions, the rate of current extinctions. We're studying uh, what's driving those extinctions. We're studying where they're occurring, what they're affecting. We're studying the e ecological consequences, and we're also studying the human, economic, social, political consequences of extinctions. So we've taken this to the point of really thinking about how extinction changes our reliance on biodiversity and how that loss of biodiversity impacts us directly. So again, we know a lot about distinction, extinction, but as I said before, maybe we're missing uh, an understanding of key aspects of extinction that may be most useful in helping us mitigate the potential for extinction in the future. And I'll go through a couple iconic examples, and I'll, I'll just back up for a second and say, um, as I was putting you know, pieces of this together last night, I was trying to think of where I could borrow slides from, from past talks. This is sort of the triage approach of the <coughs> overworked person. And, uh, and I realized that my MVZ retreat talk had a few of the same. It was like of all the talks I could give that I gave very similar, or I gave pieces of the same one. But again, that was about three minutes uh, for the MZV, MVZ retreat, which I ran into five. But anyway. <laughs> Um, but as we think about iconic extinctions in our recent past, you know, nothing has had probably a bigger role in, our, in, our national, in the national environmental movement than the extinction of bison and passenger pigeon. And of course, these, are, these were the kind of extinctions, uh, you've seen this before, the pile of bison skulls, and of course, the passenger pigeon that would blacken the sky for minutes, uh, the, the flocks were so large. But these, of course, um, as you know, were the sort of extinctions that led many folks, including folks like Joseph Grinnell, to, to scratch their heads for long periods. And it's, it's part of that, and you may know the, the collection of feathers for bird hats and eggs and all the rest are things that Grinnell got very involved in and wrote quite eloquently uh, in, 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 in pushing for conservation and pushing for <coughs> new policy to protect birds in particular. But these were iconic extinctions, and of course our local one, uh, the loss of our emblematic uh, golden bear, um, which is on I'm sure is several shirts in, in this room. But of course these are iconic extinctions, and yet I would say we know extremely little to nothing about them, at least nothing of value. This is the, if you go and Google uh, bison decline, you'll get this, which is kind of amazing. It's amazing because it's just a percentage, and it's estimated maybe 50 million. Some folks have estimated 200 million. Some folks have estimated 5 million in the original state at the year 1,000. And this curve, as far as I can tell, this, uh, this, the form of this decline is just entirely a hy hypothetical. Okay? I went and I tried to find uh, data points from the literature, and there are several data points along here for the tail. And for the bump up that's occurred and through active breeding and protection of bison. But here is probably the most important, potentially, arguably the most important extinction in North American history, certainly environmental history in North America. <coughs> and yet we know nothing about what happened during most of the time period during which the species occurred and declined. The passenger pigeon, again, it's thought maybe there were 3.5 billion. Maybe. Again, they're tough to count. We'll cut them some slack. But what's amazing about this one is that this also is entirely void of data. There we have a, a, this idea of a threshold collapse of the passenger pigeon, and yet we don't have any data. What we, we have some information. We know that whole generations 
of the economically poor in the eastern U.S. <coughs> were born and died having only eaten the meat of passenger pigeon as the only meat they consumed in their lifetime. Okay, so we know it was economically huge. We have some information about rates that pies were being made and sold, but we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened numerically to this population. And so what's amazing about this one is that the, the, the person actually went and drew little inflections and bumps and other things. Uh, just conjecture, I suppose. In our golden bear, we have three data points for the iconic golden bear of California. We think there were 10,000 and 1,600, and then there weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> and so we know that Drake sailed along the beach with Point Reyes, and he was afraid. He knew he needed to do repairs on his boat, but he was afraid. And it's in his notes. He was afraid to come ashore because the grizzly bears were everywhere. And they were feeding on dead whales and elephant seals and all the rest. And there were condors, and there just, you know, the whole wolves there are tugging at the meat of dead whales. It was chaos. And he said, we are not landing over there. Of course, he had to at Drake, what became Drake's, Drake's Beach and Point Reyes. Um, but we had a lot of these. They were full of marine isotopes uh, because they were eating the incredible rich stuff that was washing up on our shores. And we have no idea uh, what process, what numerical process led to their extinction. Even modern cases where you think we would have a lot of information and we would know a lot, like tigers, uh, we have groups like the World Wildlife Fund and dozens of other conservation groups working actively on tiger conservation. And yet we have very few data points for their population trajectories over the last 40 or 50 years. And what we have has, and I put these on from calculating th their data, is we have huge error in the estimates. We really don't know what happened. We just know we have very few. Okay. I should just warn you, my computer has been sad. Let's see what happens. And it will continue to be. Let's see. Okay. <coughs> I think I'm back. Okay, so when you saw the title of this talk, you imagined some hopefully, you know, informative, philosophical, maybe even uh, broadly informative uh, treatise on this process of extinction. And in fact, I was being very literal when I said the shape of extinction. And by shape of extinction, I'm really referring, as you can guess, to the actual form of the population's decline to extinction. And there's many different forms this can take, of course, and does take. We talk in population ecology of decay processes. That might be a linear decline of a population to extinction. You could very easily say we should expect a decay for, under some circumstances for some populations. We very often talk about threshold <coughs> trajectories, forms. We're talking about functional forms. We're talking about thresholds of extinction. And these are widely discussed. In, in, in that's, and that's what we've seen in these hypothetical uh, trajectories that have been drawn, in some cases, by historians. It's just assumed they were everywhere and there were none. They must have gone off a, a, a demographic cliff. And then, of course, all sorts of other, there's multi-state dynamics and all the rest. There's many different forms extinction can take, a process approaching extinction may take. And what I'll argue and what I'll try and show is that understanding what are the most common forms and what are the, in what circumstances different forms occur is absolutely critical in thinking about applying theory to mitigating extinction, both local extinction, which I'll talk about a lot, and global extinction. And besides, I have the authority of good old Michael Soule, and there are fewer better authorities. And so Soule told us a long time ago, he said, the extinction problem has little to do with the death rattle of its final actor. That is, we're focusing way too much on, at this time, he was responding to the small population paradigm, which was this incredible focus of research attention on tiny populations. He said, it's not the tiny populations that's so important, or that tells us a lot. It's the process that got them there. And for him, he says, what biologists want to know is about the process of decline in range and numbers. And so I'm going to talk first about the process of decline in numbers, and then I'm going to touch quickly on the process of decline in range. And I'm, as you can see, I'm going to do a lot, I've done a lot of filler because I've got like three results, and that's about it. <laughs> I'm not even sure they're great results, but anyway, I'm going to try and sell them. 
So the first thing you thought when I talked about the form or the shape of extinction is you thought, that's kind of silly because there's so many different forms, it just depends. You know, it's like a lot of things, it depends. If it's bison, well, there was a huge push of hunting and other kinds of activity in the American Midwest. And so that makes sense. It was a threshold driven by uh, over a push, a, a big pulse of, of over, over uh, extraction. But there are other cases, maybe the dynamics of chytrid in Central American amphibians or other things where maybe we will expect different shapes or different kinds of processes. And I'll try and get to that. And so you would quite reasonably argue that the th threat type and intensity should be important in, in affecting these extinction trajectories. Uh, growth rates, of course, highly fecund species should show different responses over time to, uh, or different decline processes over time. Uh, range size and distribution, life histories related to uh, population growth rate. Um, synergies among threats, what exactly is causing extinction? Is it disease? Is it habitat loss? Is it is it climate uh, tolerance, or, 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 is it, uh, or is it fire, or what's going on? That should be important. Social behavior, if we think about Ali effects, so uh, Warder Clyde Ali, quite uh, reasonably, and which has been proven to be true in many circumstances, suggested that, uh, you know, that species may reach, populations may reach thresholds below which individuals, where the demographic processes are interrupted, because individuals basically can't find each other, or they can't main uh, social, social systems. And so all of these things are likely to play a role. So what, what do we know from the literature? Well, Gauza, of course, this is a young version. I, I find it kind of sad that we always, I hope, is it, this is probably too personal. I'm just thinking of that. <laughs> when I'm dead and gone, if, if I ever come up in anyone's talk, can you do like a younger picture of me? <laughs> <laughs> I find it amazing. You know, I you see Gauza all the time, and it's like when he's old and wizened, and you're like, there's no way he had any cool ideas. Come on. Like, <laughs> this young, you know, <laughs> this super, superstar dude, you know, he was incredible. And so Gauss, of, co of course, maybe not always intentionally trying to do it, but is there, uh, is looking at some of the first population trajectories to extinction in his petri dishes, basically. And of course, we use these, the reason we still teach his work all the time is because he was looking at, again, early predator-prey dynamics and other things, but he provides some of the first laboratory work. And there have been several groups that have actually <coughs> looked at extinction dynamics. And again, when I say extinction dynamics, I mean this, the form, the shape of this population decline, the demographic dynamics for populations approaching extinction. Griffin and Drake have really done the most, probably, in recent times, uh, primarily in, again, laboratory experiments. And they have, I think, eight, nine, maybe ten papers in the last ten years looking at the, these dynamics in laboratory systems. Engen and Sather um, had, uh, it's funny because I've always called this a classic paper, and it's where they basically are pushing the concept of population viability analyses, and they're modeling extinction trajectories. So they're doing, they're addressing this question through a theoretical basis. And I always call it classic, and I actually looked it up, I was just curious, I was like, maybe before I call it classic, but it's been <coughs> cited 46 times in 17 years, which is not quite classic. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's classic to me, and they're pretty amazing researchers. And so there's been a lot of theoretical work uh, over, over the last 15, 20 years. Again, thinking about what are the dynamics, what are the demographic parameters that would lead to these different types of processes. But it was really only... Uh, 10, 11 years ago that Bill Fagan and Elizabeth Holmes actually said, hey, let's take some empirical data from outside of the lab and let's actually plot. Uh, <laughs> and what they're plotting here is this is years before extinction. So this is a population ex a approaching extinction and this is population size. And so they looked at a random assortment of data that they pulled from the literature, like African, a population of African wild dogs I think it's probably uh, <coughs> Flaviventris, a marmot, um, two populations of wood turtle. I mean, it sounds kind of you know random, but this is what they could come up with: a woodpecker, golden plover, and what they saw. And this was really the first effort to bring together a few different species and try and characterize the form of an extinction process. And what they said is, it's consistently powerful threshold dynamic. These are populations accelerating into extinction. 
And so I, I was interested in this, and I've been working in, in Ghana here, this country in West Africa, about the size of Oregon. I've been working in Ghana for almost 20 years um, and with the Ghana Wildlife Division. And specifically, I've been working with the Ghana Wildlife Division both in their bio biodiversity monitoring program, but also in organizing and analyzing the incredible uh, bi biodiversity, particularly wildlife monitoring information they've been collecting <laughs> since independence in the early 1960s. And so what this, uh, what this monitoring has meant is that in six protected areas, and six national parks across Ghana, rangers at every ranger post within these protected areas have gone out and conducted transects of set length and recorded all the larger mammals, and birds and reptiles actually, but I'm focusing on mammals here, that they observe during these transects. And they do it every month at every station in every park. And it's quite amazing. It's not high tech. It's not you know, drones raining from the sky or anything, but it's very effective, and in part because it's a big hammer. If you do it a lot, you do it often, and you do it the same way, and you do it for 40 years, and you've really got something. And I, and I often say, and I really believe, it exceeds anything we've accomplished in biodiversity monitoring, certainly in vertebrate monitoring in North America. Um, and this is for, and of course, the budget for the whole park system is uh, significantly smaller than, you know, College of Natural Resources here on campus, significantly. So uh, I'm going to be, I was particularly interested and have been studying the sort of the historical dynamics of 41 species of larger mammals. And they include sweet, smaller, uh, bovid, smaller antelope, um, some of these larger herbivores from elephants to, to hippos, um, incredible diversity of primates, and as well as the top carnivores, like lions, spotted hyenas, African wild dogs, and leopards up there. And across these six protected areas, the time series that have been collected, these observational time series, include 78 cases of local extinction within a protected area. That means 78 times a population of one of these species uh, became extinct, if that makes sense, and did not, was not recovered. And so I want to give you, again, a closer idea of how this sampling occurred. So this is the largest park in Ghana, Mole National Park. And so sampling occurred every month at every one of these ranger posts. Okay, so 12 samples a year at every ranger post. So as you start to put this all together, you can develop uh, an understanding of spatial change in observation. You can use observations and you can, you can uh, account for detectability for those in the group who, who were ready to shake their heads. You can account for detectability and look at shifts in, in distribution. Here I'm just showing blue to indicate uh, where, you know, I, I'm interpolating between sites to show that the spotted hyena was observed at every site across the park in 1971, and by 1999, it was only really observed in areas around uh, the core of the park. And of course, you can do, because these are monthly counts at each of these sites, you can do old-fashioned time series analysis. And not, 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 not old-fashioned, elegant time series <laughs> analysis. So with the help of Cheryl and Felix and others, the first thing we did is look at population trajectories for these 78 local extinctions. And this is just a group of them. And what you see is we're looking at the growth rate, so year-to-year -year population growth rate, as a function of the time to extinction. So as a population approaches zero, obviously, uh, in years. So this is year zero is the year that, that extinction occurred. So we're trying to normalize across all these different time series. And what you'll see, right, again, you get a sense of year-to-year -year variability in population growth, and you get a sense of, of also what's happening demographically as these populations approach extinction. And so if we put this all together and we use these multi-level mixed regressions with autocorrelated error structures and all the rest to try and satisfy the statisticians, we can actually plot these data together over time, and we can we can essentially drop a line through it. So for carnivores, and I'm not showing standard deviations, which I should, but I couldn't figure that out yet, though I will show it later for a different analysis. For carnivores, the trajectory to extinction, that is uh, the, pop, the change, the population growth <coughs> dynamic as the population to extinction is strongly threshold for ungulates as well and for primates. They're all doing the same thing. They're all falling off a cliff as they approach extinction. And they're being driven to extinction in these parks for different reasons. Okay? 
So we're seeing a very strong and consistent trajectory to extinction. What's also interesting, and I think important, is if we look at the coefficient of variation, which is, again, a, 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 which is a measure of the year-to-year -year variability in these populations, what we can see is that in 20 years or 15 years from extinction, the populations are not extremely variable. But there's a point before the threshold is reached where these populations start to show dramatic increases and declines in, back, in consecutive years. So we start to see turbulence in this population. You start to actually see populations that are going to soon become extinct increase dramatically. That's strange, right? That should be strange. And it happens again and again. So what's going on here? Well, it fits the old idea of an extinction vortex. And this is from uh, Michael Gilpin and Michael Soule, going back to Soule's 1986 book. And you'll recognize there are small population paradigm components. There could be, there certainly could be drift, genetic drift and inbreeding components, a lot of demographic variation. But there's a whole bunch of things that are going to be at play, and in many cases things we don't know are things that differ between populations. But we are seeing strong evidence across these 78 extinctions involving 41 different species of, of this vortex event. That is an acceleration, inverse density dependence, an acceleration. If the population gets smaller, this population growth is declining faster rather than showing typical density dependence. And as we start to look through better data sets that are out there, we start to see this again and again. We see it in even historical populations, things like the, the thylacine, Tasmanian um, tiger. Start to see it in things in a variety of different bird populations. The island, the, what's interesting, and I'm, I've been reaching out for more of the original data, the collapse of birds of Guam, which you know about through the brown tree snake. Uh, nearly all of the birds throw, show, all the extinctions show these uh, <coughs> amazingly powerful threshold dynamics. You can imagine with cod, and I had never known this before, but that Imagine these years when they are like, the cod flow like wine, you know, this, this is the new dawn of a great era. Uh, so this incredible explosion right before the end, uh, like a last gasp. Sadly, the, the delta smell seemed to be also involved in a strong threshold. The American eel, which is more closely monitored by Canada, typical. Uh, <laughs> threshold collapse. Sea turtles. Just to keep this audience interested, <laughs> salamanders, of course, this is our own Sean Revito and David Wake and others uh, in, in the room. But again, as you travel the world, and here it's a different driver, I assume, but you're seeing these incredible threshold dynamics, incredible variability. Uh, I'm trying to remember the giant, what's it, the Chinese giant? Yeah. 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 Chinese, yeah. Chinese giant yeah. salamander here, you're looking at larva, even larva production, powerful threshold dynamic. And so looking through literature, I realized, wait, there's a lot more out there than, uh, certainly than, than um, you know, Fagan was looking at at the time. So I thought with some of these amazing new repositories, like the Global Population Dynamics Database, which now has, I think, more than 7,000 time series, um, other various states that have different, uh, uh, different time series available, Global Biodiversity Informatics Facility, which has, I think, more than a thousand time series. I worked with, particularly with Moses and with uh, some uh, volunteers and assistants to try and start pulling together data for a meta-analysis. What we ended up with was 470 time series for 398 species. And <coughs> like as often happens, most of the data are from birds, but we have mammals, fish, Oh, I, as I said to Paul, three plants, which I think is most of the plant life on the planet, right? <laughs> uh, I have to tease Paul whenever I can. Uh, but so we, we pulled together all these time series, and we did the same thing. We, we normalized by looking at years <coughs> to extinction. And what we come up with, and these are across the planet, and I, I didn't pull together the nice, and haven't pulled together the nice map that shows the different data sources. But basically, populations around the planet. And I, I need to mention that our criteria wasn't that these were local extinctions, but that these were populations that reached 1% or less of their observed max maxima. So these are not true all the way to extinction, but they're populations that got very tiny and stayed, and stayed tiny. And what we see across the world and across taxa is evidence of strong, very strong threshold dynamics. 
And we also see the same thing regarding variability. Variability from year to year across these 378 species, these populations are starting to bounce around. They're coming in for a, a cruel evolutionary landing and they're getting turbulence as the, as right, before they, right before they crash. What's also concerning is that if you break out this year-to-year -year variation in these time series for all these different species, we see that time series recorded from 2000 to 2010 generally show by significantly more variance. So populations today, at least, and there's bias in what's being monitored and the precision with which it's being monitored. So I accept all of that. But there's strong evidence that populations today, I would argue probably around the world, are showing much greater year-to-year -year variation. And if you believe the previous result, that suggests there's greater risk that we're going to see these thresholds. We're going to see populations falling off cliffs, as it were. So Soule, the Soule quote said before, it's not just extinction process in numbers, but also in range. And I, it's something I'm very interested in, but only looked at quickly. And as you know, there's a whole bunch of different processes by which a declining population, uh, declining numerically, will show uh, constant, or, uh, a, sh a reduction in range. <coughs> I better pick it up here a little bit. But we have things like the grizzly bear, which once, of course, had this massive Y distribution and has just been pushed back sort of systematically coming from the south for the most part. We have more complex range contractions. This whole darker tan area is the historical distribution of the lion, African lion, Panthera leo. The darker area indicates this sort of patchwork mosaic of its current distribution. <coughs> Even things like the elk, which I had no idea occurred in Pennsylvania, but anyway, uh, and also I, I, realized, I was looking at this, I was like, why is this, why is this figure making me feel anxious? And I realized like red showing up on a map of the U.S. is like almost a triggering. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. All right. I'm, I'm going there again. I'm going there again. Uh, so anyway, but so we have all of these, if you look across known range contractions, we have a, seems to be a whole bunch of different dynamics going on. And ecology and biogeography have spent far too little time on this, because again, it's extremely important. I mean, Michael Soule said it was extremely important, so it's got to be. But actually, Channel and Lomolino, and I, this is a classic paper in Nature, really got into this for the first time that I've seen in, in, a, in a substantive way. But they got into it in a th theoretically more than anything else. But they came up with what they called their demographic hypothesis and their contagion hypothesis. The demographic hypothesis was that uh, we can think of a range of a species as being kind of a core area of high productivity and edge areas of lower productivity. And so a population will decline because the lower productivity areas around the edge, uh, animals will start to dis or individuals will start to disappear and die off, and there'll be this concentration. Their contagion hypothesis was that extinction will occur like a wave, as it were, like a wave uh, contagion, like a disease that spreads across a range. So in that case, we should see directional uh, directional events. Now to me, and thinking about these time series data sets, I translated these into things that I could test. And one was, by this model, if the core area is the highest density, is the best habitat, then the spatial extent of the range should contract faster than the population size. Does that make sense? You can reject that and we'll, we can talk about it afterward. The contagion hypothesis suggests to me that range should contract at the same rate as population size. Now there will be some variation. The, the extinction pushes first through these uh, less than ideal e edge areas, uh, but then it's pushing through the middle, and so the contraction should occur at the same, the two rates of contraction. But I have another uh, hypothesis for how extinction would occur, which I call the evaporation hypothesis. And that is that extinction or the change in range that we can imagine extinction as a species distribution as a puddle not unlike uh, Lomolino, uh, Channel Lomolino did here you can think of it as a, pu as, as a puddle but population decline is occurring as that puddle gets shallower and shallower right there's evaporation so the edges will retreat a little bit but at the, pop the population as a whole is being reduced if that process is going on, and that's the only process I can think of that would give rise to the case where population size may contract faster than range size. So you still have the extent of the puddle to some degree, but it's getting shallower and shallower. So you have fewer, fewer individuals. 
So we can think about how we might test this, and we were able to pull together 121 population series for 96 species uh, where we had both range information and population numbers, trend inf information. And what we basically thought is that if it trends on this side of the graph, then abundance is declining faster than range. If it's on, so this is reduction in population range, reduction in population number. If we see most of the pattern on this size, then the range is contracting faster than abundance. What we see when we plot this is that a lot of the time series is in this area. So it actually <coughs> is an evaporation process. And again, there's remarkable consistency. There's significant consistency in how range is contracting as a function of abundance. So this is important, and, and I'll get into that in, in my last slide here. So what does all of this mean? Well, population declines across taxa, and again, many folks, particularly Paul and the world studying, of course, invertebrates and other things, can say, yeah, I don't really buy that you've represented all the groups, and we haven't at all. But there is good evidence that there's very strong and consistent threshold dynamics for populations approaching extinction. Population viability, that turbulence, is much higher approaching at this population crash. And we're seeing much more population turbulence, as it were, in recent era. And I haven't looked at 2010 to 2020. The spatial extent of a collapsing population declines slower than its abundance. And so what do we take from that? I'm, I, am all, I am a basic and applied scientist and am proud of it. Conserv inter we, maybe conservation inter interventions need to occur before populations have reached these thresholds. That's kind of a no-duh, and it's sort of like saying, you know, we all need to breathe to stay alive, maybe. Um, but in this case, uh, the, the, the data suggest we need to take this much, much more seriously. And also that monitoring populations based only on their spatial distribution, and you may say, who does that? Well, actually, most of mo biodiversity monitoring is done spatially rather than numerically, because it's much easier to say, is it here or not? Than to, than to answer how many are there. But that may be misleading. It may be a poor indicator, at least on its own, of a pending population collapse. We could have things that are occurring broadly that are about to blink out. OK. And so just a last example I had to bring in. I had to get Jim interested in the talk. And so we'll bring in the most charismatic, beautiful species of the world, the giant kangaroo rat, a study animal of, of mine. And so what does this mean for systems like the southern San Joaquin? The giant kangaroo rat occurs with 13 other federally listed or state and federally listed endangered and threatened species in that system from invertebrates and plants and all the rest. What does it mean for these small pocket populations um, that are almost kind of relic at this point? Well, we've been studying these populations for a while. We see a huge amount of variability. And generally what we say is this is, this goes to 2006, this is our last Actually, not our last trapping session. So our last trapping session was last two months ago. But this goes to April 2016. And of course, we see this incredible 96% population decline. But it's our, that was our drought, right? And this whole, this whole ecosystem, this is, uh, you can't really see it back there, but plants, herbivores, carnivores are all bouncing around dramatically. And they're almost all, except the herbivores, tanking during our drought cycle. So is this just business as usual? Is this semi-arid California working its way through a natural drought, drought dynamics? Or is this a population hitting a series of populations, uh, the only populations really of, of their species, for many of these species, uh, appro you know, approaching the end? And, and that's a tough question. Um, and one I'll just leave you with. So thanks very much. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. And I think there are, I mean, I think some of the important next steps are to break up uh, some, I mean, so we're still adding to the whole data set. That's the first thing, but then to hopefully get to the case where we have sample sizes where though we see the consistent pattern to really start breaking it up. And so we could break it up and that could, you know, would be one of the questions. Um, I mean, I'll turn it back on you. What would you expect in that, in that population dynamic? I would have no, I would think that there would be chronic turbulence yep. over a long amount of time, but if you have turbulence all the time, 
That's right. Would you go extinct more often? So that's exactly, I mean, I think you're hitting on that, that critical question and it relates to, to this majestic species as well as others is, you know, is that turbulence uh, just an innate part of the population dynamic? Is it a boom bust? Is it small effective sizes that are very, I think, I think that can be an innate part of a population dynamic. I think it always probably was in many of California's and others know much more. I'm looking at someone who knows much more than I do about this, but I think the key was that there were all, that was always going on in a metapopulation dynamic where these populations occurred very widely. And now they don't, right? So they're very limited. So there's much more forgiveness for local extinction. Yeah, John? If, if you take the data you showed indicating that population sizes decrease faster than yeah. habitat, <clears throat> and you separate it out by home range okay, size right. of the species. Does it sort on that yeah. uh, dimension? That's a great question, and I, it's too, I mentioned the half-baked part. You part of being half-baked is I haven't done that, but that's a great, that's a great thing. And I, we yeah. could do that, that's a, a, you know, we can come up with allometric home range yeah. uh, data and, and do that, so that's a great, great question, Paul. So the result that the populations are, are more variable Recently, yeah. Um, an alternative hypothesis would be that I don't know extreme climate events or something are right. causing variation in population. And I wondered if if you could compare these threatened species uh, population dynamics with species that aren't threatened and see if if they're both having this variation, then that might suggest climate. But if they're not, then it might. Help. Yeah, that's another great suggestion. And we haven't done. I mean, I think there's a couple times where it came up. Uh, this is your saying where you said, "Wait, we should compare." what's going on here to populations that we know, you know, reach the end of a time series and they're still stable at some level. So it's a great point, and I don't. Yeah, you got all three of the plants. I mean, you got the tree, you got the bush, <laughs> yeah. you got the grass, but maybe you haven't done vine. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> he got me back. I knew he would. Yeah. So what hypotheses are there for the dramatic increase in so many populations right before extinction? Why you know, that? I'd love to hear from from other folks, you know, what's going on there. I mean, I think uh, I've heard it said, you know, I've heard, well, what, what you'll hear, see sometimes, of course, in some of the in some of the trophic dynamics is like cod or something maybe will benefit through a, re a release of, uh, from its own predators and maybe some competitors or there'll be, which will, you know, lead to a temporary, you know, uh, incredible, you know, boom in its, in its prey or other things, but that it's totally unstable. Uh, but I, I'm really, I don't think there's a single answer for that, but I'd love to hear if, again, I'm, I'm pushing off into some new theoretical ground myself. I'd love to see if people are more familiar with this, this increased dynamic prior to crash. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, just on that, you know, the, the feedbacks, if you have a low population, the variability in feedbacks is going to be very much greater, whereas if you have high population, sort of everything is at the, at the uh, maximum, yeah. and so the feedbacks are sort of consistent. So right. it might be just the fact that these are complicated systems, and there are lots of interactions of various kinds, and it only takes a little bit <coughs> here and there, you know, to sort of reverber reverberate through the system, whereas if everything is densely yeah. packed, then, you know, there's, there's going to be relatively little yeah. uh, effect, or it's going to be dampened. Right. Who right. knows? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, no, I think that's that's right, Dale. And I think also the fact that, you know, you're cal we're calculating population growth rate, yeah, at smaller population size, it takes a smaller true numerical change to achieve a greater uh, change in in population growth rate, if that makes sense. So there, you you know, you might say, but I think also um, I was thinking about uh, you know if uh, I, my old mentor uh, Tony Sinclair always was a big proponent of multiple states in, eco, in, in these population dynamics, and he might say that what you're seeing is populations that are density more more density dependent are reaching a point where they're basically no longer regulated by density dependent processes. Um, and so maybe that first increase is sort of a density dependent type push or something, but then the, the whole system's unstable. But yeah, I, I, I don't know the short answer. Yeah, good. One of the things that's happened with many amphibian populations is that already stressed populations are getting kicked off the cliff by infectious disease. Right. And I, I haven't seen much on infectious diseases of mammals yeah. playing that role. Yeah, 
So, I mean, I think much, much less, in, in much less sort of catastrophic situations. I mean, so I'm thinking about this Friday's wildlife conservation fishery seminar speaker, Eric Doherty, who works on anthrax dynamics. And, you know, anthrax is, a, is an interesting uh, case where it does have, you know, dramatic die-off events in some cases and is much more chronic in others. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think we really have the, we have things like uh, white nose yeah. in, in bats is probably <coughs> the closest the closest model, and that is the, di the initial die-off was exponential. I mean, it was catastrophic. Um, Brucella. Yeah. Is that what Brucella dynamic looks like? Uh, yeah. Is wondering how many of these time series, like this one you show here, get small and recover so that the analyses can be framed around those that went extinct versus those that didn't. Right. It seems like it's, it's a censored sample. It is. It seems yeah. like that yeah. could lead to views that maybe don't tell the story you really want to tell mm -hmm. without knowing the ones that didn't go extinct. Yeah. So yeah, the, the ones, all of the ones we took are, are cases where there was not a recovery right. within the time series that was shared. Um, but there are, I mean, one thing, so certainly there are real, real bias in what people choose to study and, and how. Um, and you're right. We could we could definitely go back. Uh, it's related to what Paul was saying too. We could go back and expand to include uh, populations that came out of an extinction mm -hmm. dynamic and have to look at differences. We just haven't done it, but it's a good a good point. But there shouldn't be bias in the sense that when people started the monitoring, you can't start the monitoring after they went extinct. So that's right. <laughs> there's not bias in that. And that's sense. a big so reason. And no one really wants to monitor different. tiny populations because they're yeah. very typically. Yeah. And so yeah. there's huge bias against. That's I think that's has been historically the biggest reason why we know so little about these dynamics, like at the end of life right. uh, for mm -hmm. these populations, is because it's an, an inherently. And, and we start too late, right, when we do, like black-footed ferrets or some things. We, we missed the whole decline phase. We weren't paying attention. So you tantalized us with it. If you understand the shape of the extinction, we'll be able to do something about it. I haven't seen the connection yet. Yeah. Oh, boy, I was hoping no one was <laughs> I have figured that out, and that, but that's on a pay per access site. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it was the teaser, and now I, um, you know, I'm still really thinking through. I'm going to need the help of my brilliant students and others to really go through and think. I, I'm a little bit too familiar with state and federal management and other things. I'm a little bit too familiar, and NGOs, to believe that. I, we just need to show. I just need to show everybody the graph, and we'll say, "Holy cow, let's do it now!" Now we're gonna, we're gonna do it. I think you know our. Uh, I mean, you know our. As you, I'm sure you know well our ESA and all of our legislature, CEQA and everything are set up to deal with populations that have already gone off the cliff. Um, and so, one thing this advocates <coughs> for is revisiting that. But others have called for revisiting that anyway because we're dumping a ton of money into species, uh, you know, that, uh, of course, that, again, are already in, in demographic uh, duress. But, um, so this definitely pushes for that. It supports, you know, ecosystem-based uh, conservation strategies, for sure. But whatever, if there is something to what you say, in order to mitigate the problem, you have, you have to start with what caused it. So none of this addresses what caused it. So you really right. know when you're not in better shape to do something about it. Right, but I think it, I, I absolutely agree with you. You still, you know, that was Stan Temple's, you know, sort of uh, uh, sort of cry against all this reintroductions and all the rest is, you know, we're, we're not dealing, if you're not dealing with the underlying drivers, you're wasting everybody's time and money. Um, I think in this case, I mean, one of the remarkable things is that the same, <laughs> Demographic process is occurring across a huge number of different different drivers, and I think I think it says more. It doesn't it doesn't say like okay, this is the, this should be the strategy for for setting aside land, or this should be climate mitigation, or or all the rest. I think it says more about stepping back. It really is asking for a broader perspective on stepping back and looking at how we view endangerment um, and 
um, and how we invest in, in mitigating against it. So you, you, you raise a, a very good point, but I think it's, uh, as, as I was suggesting earlier, it's, there's not a simple answer for changing how, how we deal with threatened and endangered species. But if anyone wants to bail me out, you know, now, would be, now would be the time. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Some of your time series were for the same species. So could you take one of the time series and use it to predict sort of the time scale at which you predict another local population to go extinct? Meaning, like, you have data from, like, any of the amphibian extinctions. We have data from some populations about how fast it can occur. That gives us an idea of how fast we might expect kids to kill some Yeah, yeah. So I haven't done that, but... That's, it's possible. There isn't, and you're right, and, there, you, and there's, there are small, probably, issues of pseudo-replication with where multiple, a single species will be re represented several times. But I don't think any species was represented more than three times in almost 500 time series. So we hope that that was washed out. But you're, you're, you're right, there's, there's potentially power to saying, uh, how can we use this to predict? Um, and again, I think, I mean, I think you could take this and say, develop, uh, ideas for demographic early warning systems. But again, you know, as we as we talk about a lot in conservation biology, I always say, you know, we're the scribes of the demise. Like we okay, it's all going to hell. Yep, it's still really you know, but you can come up with a really good uh, demographic early warning system and say, if everybody you think you have a ton of black tailed deer in California, but their populations are doing this, you know, based on this model, we think we think they could fall off a cliff. And whether or not I think it's a you know, really going back to your big issue, I think is more as these things often are about about political and, and social dynamics. And I didn't think I'd get into that in MVZ, but it's a good good place to go. Grinnell definitely got into it. All right, maybe with that, uh, let's thank Justin again.